Okay, so Okay, I think we almost have everyone. Still there are a couple of students not here. Yeah, I apologize, so I made some mistake. Uh, when I take a break, somehow I turn off the, the Zoom. I hope the recording is still there when I just, but uh, now I did the recording, right? So, Let's see if more students is coming. 11 student. We're losing a couple of students. Anyway, let's uh, start chapter five. So before the, let me do the screen sharing. So I guess you can see it. Yeah, for some reason. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so before the break, uh, we mentioned about uh, this exercise. You can try the recursion tree to guess the result. Then you apply the um, induction to prove. But uh, you may wonder that uh, are there any give you an expression, can you find directly? Uh, fortunately, there is a, a, a theorem called master theorem. So it's not a master algorithm I, I mentioned in the first class. That uh, for certain shape or type, uh, there is uh, a standard solution, right? So I'm not sure I guess the, all of you learned this, right? It is yes. covered. Yeah, so it's all covered. So yes. this just uh, refresh your memory in case you... So I just want to point out a couple of uh, things. One is that the master theorem is not really master. It means that there's certain situation you cannot really derive. So it's not cover all the situation, but vast majority of cases, uh, you can express this recursion of the shape like this. Uh, the shape is like this one is that uh, suppose you have a Tn, right, Tn, and you divide into sub problem the size n divided by b, b is any number larger than one, and with a coefficient a. So the key things is about this Fn, right? So we see some example like Fn can be one, that means it costs only constant time to combine. Or you can have a, a situation combined is n, like a merge sort. So it depends on the f value, f n value. So there is an expression here. If you're good in math, you can easily calculate that. Then you can get the final expression, something like this. The third situation is a little bit complex, depends on you have to check a certain condition. So I'm not going to go through this. Uh, just show you some of the, this example. For example, if you have a Tn, n divided by three times nine plus n, and this equals n squared based on this master theorem. If you change a little bit, like you divide by three times two, or two over three, uh, but you add a constant, then it's log n. You see that? 
And this one is I divide by two, you have a nine, eight copy, but the combined function is n squared, then it's n cubed. And if the, this one is like log n, n log n, results still log n log n. But if this one is n, it's still n log n, and so on. So I'm not going to go through this. Since this is typo, this should be n squared. But anyway, so you just, uh, uh, if you don't uh, remember or you need to refresh your memory, uh, you can go through that. There's one question in the homework assigned this one, but we assume this you already know. So we skip that. Now we do something really exciting. It's something new, not in the textbook. I just want to give you, I want to cover a little bit more information, which is more interesting because all this merge sort is not really exciting. It's so old, right? So we'll talk about the parallel merge sort, especially now in the big data era. So lots of data you want to sort and you have lots of machine, lots of people. So how are you going to do it quickly? You want to sort the sequence, right? So one easy way, which is kind of naive, then people, you can imagine, the first one called merge sort with parallel recursion. So basically is that uh, you have n, you have lots of people, lots of people. Look at each level, right? Bottom level, you have lots of pair, right? n minus one pair. You just imagine that for each merge, you have one person is doing the work then it's not big deal, right? Very fast. It's very fast, but as you go up, it's getting slower. Why is that? Because the merge process is not parallel. For example, you want to merge uh, 100 subsequent uh, size of 100, another also 100. You one person doing it. Uh, you cannot really two people do the parallel how you do the parallel merge. There's no parallel merge concept, right? Understand that? So you can see that uh, sometimes sometime you deploy lots of machine. It doesn't really help much. That because initially data is very small, you can do parallel. As you merge and the number of uh, thread or, or process becomes smaller, but the job is a merging job become complex and more complex because you have to merge two sorted subsequence. So that means this one does not, uh, I mean, increase, but uh, still have a, a complexity, right? So the, 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 the execution time, the, the execution time is in the order of n. Calculate why it's order of n. Because you, when you merge two subsequence, it's a linear time. So you merge of a half of that, so it's a half n. Then the next level merge is uh, uh, n divided by four, then plus n divided by a, right? So if you sequence add together, it's n. So no matter how many people are involved, it's n. And in fact, this is not really efficient. So I will tell you two schemes, popular ones called parallel multi-way merge sort. Another one was merge sort with parallel merge. Oh, okay. And there's another, uh, there are other thing, uh, there are many other sorting parallel merge. So called multi-sequence selection. So you can have a multi-sequence select. And uh, sometimes, so we'll discuss a concept called cost of cost optimal. Cost optimal really means that when you introduce n parallel machine, n people, you expect the linear speed up. Right? That, that's what we discuss. If you introduce a lots of people, you, you expect the speed up also the number of people. If it's below that, that means not 100% efficient. So there are lots of interesting idea, but I just want to throw the idea first, then you see how we can apply. See this line merge sort with two layer. So you can divide, you look at this uh, like uh, pyramid shape, right? Pyramid shape. So initially there are lots of lots of small things, small. 
So at the bottom layer is you can deploy some kind, you have two type of algorithm, merge algorithm. Initially you can deploy some kind of slow algorithm, but it's very efficient. Efficient means that uh, you achieve uh, linear speed up. But as you go up the layer, what happened? Initially everyone's busy. If you go up, then lots of people are idle. So are you going to just let these people get idle or machine idle? No. So that means we can afford to implement some kind of inefficient algorithm. Inefficient means there are lots of waste, but it's very fast. Yeah. So there is uh, this kind of very powerful concept. You can divide a problem depends on the size of the data. Uh, the data is uh, very, very big. You, may, you can apply one algorithm where data becomes small. Since we have lots of machine, we can afford to, to uh, I mean, you don't want the machine to idle then you can deploy some other, another program. Okay, let's start with the first one called parallel multi-way merge sort. And this is a use, probably you heard this uh, Hadoop or map reduce or map shuffle reduce. So the idea is simple is that uh, you can consider T1, T0, T2, T3, like four machine. So you have lots of data coming in, right? Lots of data. So you, you, you just partition the data into four different pieces. You see different color, red, uh, blue, green, black, all this data. But the ultimate goal is to have a combined sorted sequence. But you just let everybody busy and uh, get data. But within each uh, uh, machine, so you, de you define some kind of uh, like a sample. Right? Sample means that you want to partition the, the data based on the relative uh, value compared to the sample value. So this, these are the, uh, the sample. Sample means that you sort based on this kind of sample. Then uh, each, uh, each uh, machine, you have a sorted sequence, sorted one. That's how you need to combine. Right? Combine, how you combine? Remember you, you, this, uh, you have uh, all this uh, uh, three, Sample, right? Three sample means just sample one means all the num all the data less than this sample. And in between sample one, and sample two, this is another one. Then this is so you have a po four pieces. For example, this four sample one is say five, another one is 10, another 25. So the first set of data is any data less than five. The second uh, section is five to 10. Another section is 10 to 25. Last section is 25 to $1, right? So you, you, all this red is four different, four different chunk, green four different chunk. Then you have kind of concept called shuffle. Shuffle means that each chunk sent to one destination. Anything less than five cents go to the first machine. So you see very small one. The second one between five to 10 go to the second machine. Then the third chunk Go to the third one, fourth chunk through that one. And you can see that inside this one, part of it is already sorted, but some of them not. So it's basically, it's like a merge sort, right? Then you can just do a merge sort. But it's kind of in place, really means that once it's sorted, all the data in T0 will be smaller than T1, and T1 will be smaller than T2, T2 smaller than T3. So you get that idea? Right, so it's just kind of like parallel sort, but also it's kind of a merge. So I think this uh, diagram just shows everything. Again, the number of sample is number of machine less than one. So you, you divide the data right, into different chunk of certain size range. Then you send all this uh, different range to different machine so that the machine zero get all the smaller one, machine one get the next batch, then two and three. The internally they do this merge sort. After each one sorted, they don't really need to communicate each other because machine zero will get all the smaller one between zero and five. Machine one will be from five to 10. And then the two is to 10 to 25, three is 25 to $1, something like that. So this is a very popular one. 
uh, in the Hadoop paradigm. This is how we right now people use how you sort the data. Another one, which is uh, very powerful, called parallel merge. Algorithmically, this is much more beautiful. You see the problem of uh, previous one like this. When you combine, right? When initially you have n people or n machine, you have n data, you can just do it. But as you merge and merge, then the piece of data become larger and the number becomes smaller. So there are some people that are not doing anything, uh, some machine idle. Now the question is during the merge process, can you do parallel merge? All right, so think about, is it possible to merge parallelly? If you have two guys, I can do one. The question is how you how partition two sequence, two sorted sequence. Right. So that's the key. Again, there is a, uh, depends on the model we use. So one famous model called PRAM model. PRAM means that uh, parallel random access machine. By the way, I didn't mention about the first model, which is Hadoop model is uh, like a message passing. Really means that the data, everyone own piece of data in a local machine. If you want to send the data, you have to physically send the data through the switches. Right? So that's what we call shuffle. So actually this is a big deal. Especially nowadays, everyone talking about uh, machine learning, big data. The question is that, do you want to place all the data in one location or each one own the data and exchange, exchange data a certain way? Right? So that's the difficult one. This one is a totally different view. Use like a shared memory model, means I use centralized put some data like in a, in a memory, like a big memory that everyone can access but they can access parallel, parallel, very important. Just imagine a database, you can, you can do parallel. But there is a one tricky thing is that what happened that if two machines access the same data, what are you going to do? But this de depends on whether it's a read or write. If it's read, probably it's okay, right? Means that you can read both state, both machines read the same data without conflict. But when you write, you have to be careful. Uh, usually ex exclusive right, right? Although there's a concept called concurrent right. That's why under this model, there's a many, basically three models, or four, four type of model. But uh, the res most restrictive one called, called ERU, ERU model means exclusive read, exclusive write, which is most restrictive, meaning that if you access the same data, no matter read or write, you have to do a sequential way. But there's some tricky way that uh, you can speed up. Basically, you, through the data replication, you replicate the log in time, everyone get, can do the parallel access. So you get that idea. For example, you have a one copy, you make a copy, then you get two copy. Then the two copy make one more copy, they get four copy, right? So each time you make a copy, you double the size. So that's why you only log in copy time, you get the end copy then everyone can access. So I'm not going to go through this detail, but I want to focus on the algorithm. The algorithm is basically how you merge P and Q and parallel merge. So this is already sorted, P is a sorted, and this one is another sorted. So it depends on this one. Uh, so what you can do is that you, you start with the P, you pick the middle point called split. And you compare with the first element of a Q. The middle one compare the first one. If this middle one is smaller than the first element of Q, what that mean? That means all the elements in the Q are smaller than the half of the, the second half of a P. Then the merge process become easy. Why is that? Because you can remove this, the white color part. So you basically reduce the size to one fourth. You, you take away one fourth of the space. They can repeat the same process. It's like a divide and conquer, right? And same idea. Then you compare the last element of Q against the middle elements of P. If this element, this element, last element is smaller than 
the middle elements of P. Then you can take, uh, take out uh, which one? The black color of the P, second part of P, because all this one elements is larger. You don't need to sort. See, it is a kind of smart way, not, not like from beginning from left to right, right? So you can, you can uh, get a, a constant fraction, constant fraction, that's key, constant fraction. Once you get a constant fraction, then you can do divide conquer very easy, log n, very quick. But what happens if we neither case? Neither case means that if this one is a larger, first one is larger than this middle one, but middle one is smaller than the last element of this one. So then it's a perfect, means that I can do a divide and conquer and you find a cutting point in somewhere in the middle so that this cut is larger than this middle split, but split is larger than the cut plus one, you can always find this one, use a binary search, right? Find this cut position so that cut is, a cut is smaller than split, split is larger than, oh, sorry. Cut is smaller than split, split is smaller than cut plus one. So what this really say that you can completely separate these two sequence, white, sequence and black sequence. And these two sequence can do it merge separately, parallel, and they just combine. Do you get that? So that's the, that's the key. That's the key. So that means D is the ideal situation. I mean, so all the other cases are fine because you take out half of the, uh, one fourth of the, the length. This take also one fourth. But this one is like a split into two, right? white one always the smaller than all the black one. Then this is how you do this parallel merge. Remember there's two machine there. How you do that? This is how you do it. White one, one machine, black one, another machine. Okay. So this is a basic idea of called parallel merge. Once you know do how you do parallel merge, then you can do uh, parallel sort. So a couple of concepts we already mentioned, but it's key here is the speed up. Speed up really means the sequential execution time and parallel execution time. That's the speed up. Ideally you want to speed up uh, equal to the number of machine you introduce, but in reality it's not, right? Reality is not means a speed up versus number of machine um, processor. I think this I took it wrong should be speed up divided by number of processor. So it's usually efficiency is less than, less than, the, less than one, right? If equal one means the speed up equals number of the processor. So there is a concept of cost means the number of processor times the parallel time, that's a cost. So that's a cost optimal really means that uh, your cost of parallel cost equals sequential cost. Means number processor in sequential is one and sequential time. So there is some, uh, lots of work done aiming to cost optimal solution, cost optimal solution. Really means that you want to find the maximum number of machine you introduce, but not excessive. So that uh, speed up still is linear. So I wrote a paper a while ago called the merge two sorted subsequence. And uh, this is the key. Number of processes you use n divided by log n square. So it's not n. If you use n, then it's no longer a linear speed up, too many. Right? You don't use too many processes. But the merge process become quite fast is log n square merge process, okay. And uh, if you're interested, you can read that paper. It's in, in the sense that it's interesting, I, I deploy like a two type of algorithm. Really the, when the, the size of the sequence become, you see initially you have lots of element to merge. So you apply one algorithm. When the size of the, the each uh, subsequence become certain size, you have to switch another algorithm in order to meet 
the cost optimal solution. So it's kind of tricky. Remember this merges like, uh, uh, it's like a pyramid. It's, it's the same as a, is a, is a pyramid. Really it means that initially it give you a, let's just use this example. You have two subsequent, very long, initially half N, half of N, right? Then you just do a partition, partition. They cut into very, very small pieces, many, many small pieces. To a certain extent, the number of pieces too many, you don't have enough workers, right? So then you have to do a merge, do a sequential merge, not a parallel merge. So this probably is too much for you, but at least you know that uh, there are lots of interesting study uh, in the parallel field. Uh, I spent lots of time on the matching problem. Matching problem is like a more distributed algorithm, right? Because there is no central control. The parallel algorithm itself is very challenging. Like this merge, you see that the concept, concept of cost optimal, you want to achieve efficiency of one, means ideally you want to introduce more and more processor. But as, as you keep introduce more processor, the efficiency will go down, then you don't want that. But you just want to introduce sufficient number of processor so that efficiency still keep one, and the speed, speed up is still good. I mean, better than the sequential algorithm. And for this simple problem of merge, you even apply two algorithm. Depends on the size of the, uh, the data. Right? So you can imagine that in, a, in the area of a big data, although this is a long time ago, 17 years ago, I wrote that paper. So you can imagine that in some cases that the size of data matter, uh, you may apply different approaches based on the, the data size. Okay, so let's uh, continue. Uh, talking about searching, I would like to discuss uh, one more problem. Yeah, this is a fun part. Uh, remember when I talk about uh, greedy algorithm, we talk about generation. Now, I want to talk about something similar called searching searching and you can use some kind of a concept like divide and conquer but I call this divide and eliminate so you're searching for something and uh, one way you enumerate all the cases like a generation right you one by one but there's there are some quick way to do searching you can reduce the searching space you divide the space and you quickly check that maybe half of the space is useless then uh, you can delete. Right? So it's in some sense close related to, to divide and conquer, but it's slightly different. Again, no one studied those kind of problems, but at least not systematic. But I saw this is important. Because the basic um, divide and conquer problem even in the book, they are very easy, too easy to me. You just divide the two and somehow combine. But let's just look at some searching problem. Let's start this one, right? We, we, we can take time and you can think about uh, uh, Suppose that you have one person uh, L distance away from a long wall, just like uh, in a wall, right? That's not very high. And there's some, some treasure hidden in, in the wall. So I put a diamond there. Do you see the picture? So this is a person and they are standing there, right? Uh, but the problem is a diamond you cannot really visual, you cannot really see. Assuming that you have to physically go to the wall and you touch the wall, suppose the wall is not too high, you touch the, the wall, then you can find the diamond. Okay. But the challenge is that uh, this wall is endless, left hand side, right hand side. And you don't really know the location of a diamond. Could be on the left hand side and right hand side. You get that? And uh, the only way to, to do this, you have to walk. You cannot really jump, right? So you have to walk from one location to another location, just walk. So can you come up with an algorithm so that uh, the total distance that you walk before you find the diamond is a constant bound of this uh, distance. What mean distance? Distance, physical distance between a person right now in the red spot, right? Do you see the red spot? Red spot here. 
So the so physical distance is this one, you a diagonal line to this, uh, this diamond, we call this D, right? This D is definitely larger than L. L, this is the vertical line. This is D. And the challenge is you don't know the D location. And you don't even know where left hand side, right hand side. Can you design an algorithm so that this guy walk around, right? So touching. And at the end, the total distance that the person walked is just constant of D. So this is a kind of searching, right? It's a searching in some sense, uh, similar to like a generation, we, we generate all the possible, but it's slightly different. Any discussion or is it clear? Or maybe I can give you this like a bonus problem. You can give me uh, next time where everyone can think about that. Any question or all clear? Or someone already have a solution you can give me so you can get this, get the bonus point now. And this problem is interesting in the sense that you can do some simple mathematic calculation to demonstrate that your final strategy, searching strategy is a constant bound of distance D. Okay, now the second problem, also searching. But it's different than the searching you learn in the data structure or program technique probably. You probably know that when you do talk about searching, you always talk about uh, binary search. But you have to remember binary search has some limitation or some condition. Right? You say, oh, usually binary search. So this is an example. And this is a real practical example. For example, I like a fish. I, look, I like to steam the fish. But unfortunately, I do not know what's the best in terms of timing. Do you need really five minutes or, or six minutes or 10 minutes such that uh, the fish is not raw and the meat is still very tender? And uh, so you want to try the different number, right? But you know that from your parents you know that the minimum is uh, five, maximum is 18. Right, so it's in that range. And we assume that the one minute is the basic unit of time duration. So then we only need to try one minute, two minutes, two, but not the one and a half minutes, something like that. Now the question is that, uh, and this is a practical problem, means that how you know that, uh, suppose you say, I tried eight minutes. Eight minutes is good. You don't know. You have to taste it by comparison. For example, the first time I try eight minutes, then the next time I try 12 minutes, I find that 12, 12 minutes tastes better. So you, you, you pick a 12 minutes. Now what are you going to do next, right? You never know which is the best one. Now I'll give you some kind of range. What's the best strategy? Find the best cooking time. And uh, your searching method should be minimal. Minimum that uh, you know each fish could be very expensive. I don't want to waste all my time. Right? One one naive approach is linear approach means that I try five to five six seven eight nine whatever. You may assume this function in terms of taste is uh, uh, convex. Or, right? Means that uh, it is getting better to reach a certain point maximum and goes down. Isn't binary search here the optimal? No, so that's that's why I wanted to, to tell yeah, you. Yeah, because that's a all yeah. common. That's a common mistake people will do. Or maybe when you learn this one, you did not learn. You have to be very careful. Okay. The reason is that you, the key thing is that you don't know what's the best taste. You have to compare two. You understand that? Ah, okay, okay. I yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a uh, different than the, uh, so this is actually very good. Like uh, when you go to work, right? And so when your boss gave you a problem, let's say, oh, I learned this binary search. But actually it's not really binary search. You have to really compare. You don't even know like a 15 is better than <laughs> You have to compare two relative, right? Suppose you have a good memory again. 
Once it tastes, okay. you know which is better. But now the question that, uh, so I probably I don't need to tell you, or one approach is you try both two ends, then the, what's the next checking point, right? Tasting point. So that uh, in the worst case, you, the I'm next, talking about the, If you tried both ends and you knew where that was, the next would be to do the middle and then it's similar to binary from there. Uh, I can tell you middle is not the, the best one. That's the that's the trick. <laughs> Middle one is not good. Let me just a hypothetical to tell you. Suppose the middle one is better than the two ends. So what are you going to do the next? Going go, going the left or going right. You you cannot you cannot decide. Still cannot decide. You cannot eliminate uh, left or right. No what? Trying from both ends at the same time. Like what? five and eighteen, and then six and seventeen. No, no, but then, then, yeah, that's fine. But remember, you do both ends; it, it count twice. No, the same what? fish can be done, uh, like for one try. Like uh, five and eighteen can be one fish. Oh no, no, no! I no, the, the, no I mean, you can do that, but I, I assume that you cannot do do in this way. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. If you do both ends, <laughs> you can, you can, uh, uh, yeah. You, this obviously, this, this is better, right? So, Professor, just a quick question. The assumption here is that we do not know specifically whether the fish is under or overcooked, and that we need to establish that by comparing two tastes, right? Yeah, yeah. Only based on okay. comparison. And you cannot do sense? the other student's suggestion that you, you cook in the middle, you taste it, taste it, or then, then that's obviously it's easy, right? Yeah, because it would take like you, one third and two thirds of the time. Does that no, make no, no, more you, sense? you cannot do it. You just, each time you cook a fish, you just cook it aside. At the end, you just taste. That's the assumption. Uh, yeah, but we need like two, two, uh, two fishes, so to speak. Like two. No, no, two you, you need a you, you, no, you, you need a multiple fish. You have to. Yeah, 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 but but. So you want the minimum to... number of fishes to to find the best uh, the best uh, the cooking time. Yeah, does it make sense to start like with one third and two thirds of the of the cooking time that's recommended, like you, the you, the you range? You can try. You need to prove this is optimal. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So the key is that when you cook a fish, you just cook a one shot. You cannot taste in the middle. Right? So this is assumption. Probably I should put that. <laughs> so you, you want to minimize the number of tastes and the number of uh, tries. You see this is uh, slightly different than, than the other one. Right. But the first one is also very interesting. See if you can come up some some idea. You see that all this is kind of searching, right? Searching uh, space. The second one is in particular is a uh, is kind of search. So you want to eliminate uh, certain uh, cases, and then the, how you do that. But let's focus on the first one. Yeah, it's in particular interesting because this involves some mathematical calculation. And you need to develop some kind of strategy. Imagine you're kind of a blind person. You cannot see. You can only touch the wall and find the diamond. OK, so let's uh, continue. Let's do the counting of the inversion. This is uh, another special type of uh, uh, one. And. Uh, In the middle, I will introduce another interesting problem. Oh, this actually is a very useful in uh, nowadays. Just imagine that uh, you know lots of company, for example, Facebook and uh, YouTube. So they want to profile you. So profile really means I give you some kind of uh, preference or something. They can they can generate some kind of similarity, right? similarity. So one says that, for example, you rank the songs, you rank any song, you can have some rock and roll and uh, classic music, country music, right? and so on, or different type with the representative. Then I will ask you to rank, or rank them. Then obviously if uh, two person rank the same, so that means they have very similar, 
exactly the same taste. Right? So they, 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 they can group uh, people based on similarity. They can push some of the music or whatever to you, right? Like advertisement. So you can, they can classify people based on different type taste. Then they can uh, push some of the information to you so that uh, you hope you will addict to it or whatever. So, so what's a similarity definition? There is one way to de define is called the inversions. So suppose uh, my rank is one, two, three, N. So it really means that uh, you just label one, two, three, four, N music. And your rank is A1, A2, AQ. Right? Then we say that uh, inverted, inverted really means that if I less than J, but uh, AI is uh, less than AJ, uh, AI is uh, larger than AJ. So actually one, two, N means uh, N different music. Right. So let's just look at this one. Like me, you rank one, two, three, four, five. The other one is put the one first, then three, then four and two. So in terms of inversion is uh, you have two inversion. Why is two inversion? Because in my ranking, two is better than three. But in your ranking, three is better than two, right? And then the, the other one is two, four. Uh, in my ranking, two is ahead of four. Your ranking is four ahead of two. And notice that uh, you don't really care too much in terms of ranking whether between two and four are there any some, somewhere in the middle. Right? So that's one of the key concept. Really means that it's a relative ranking means that you favor this one against this one without worrying too much how many in the middle. You get that one? So this is called the inversion. So in other words, my similarity and your similarity differ by two inversion. And you know that for five, there are possible n square, right? n data, you have n possible pair. Uh, ranking. So the smaller number inversion are more similar of your two people. Okay. So this is very useful, as I say, in the social network and the big data analytics. I mean, this is one way, not the only way, right? uh, to find out the similarity of a taste of people or hobby. So there are other kinds of analysis in big data, for example, you extract certain features of a different person, then you look at the, how similar, how close those data in high dimensional space, right? So it, but one thing that, uh, this again, a book, I add something new. So one application is really, for me is fascinating is about voting theory. So this, I add that one, because we talk about two story about the voting. One is about uh, secure voting, right? Three votes. Another one is you ask uh, the opinion of a former president. So you want to keep your answer confidential. So you, you're doing this uh, probabilistic uh, answer, but statistically you get uh, the correct result. But there is another one, probably no one really know much. I don't know why. There is a famous theorem called Arrow's Impossibility Theorem means that in a vote, there is no perfect voting system. It's a bad news, unless there's only two party. Uh, anything voting involve more than two, you cannot have a really fair voting result unless you have a dictator. It's a very, uh, uh, very involved. I'm not going to give you an example, but I just want to show you uh, example. For example, you, you know the Georgia Senate, uh, election, right? So we have a runoff because you have a multiple parties. So in the current system, they do a, like a multi-round elimination. Really means that if no one get 50% uh, of the vote, suppose you have three candidates. I think for both case, all have a three candidate compare. So the voting rule is saying that if no one get the 50, then the, the top two will move to the second round. In fact, this is not necessary is a fair, right? but 
we're not going to go through that. The reason is very simple, is that what happened is that uh, you may have a situation that uh, two candidates have a very similar view, but split the, the votes. But there's one famous uh, paradox. So it means that there's a relative uh, 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 location, like uh, the previous case, like you, are, you see the order, right? So you rank one person ahead of the other one. Like in me case, two is ahead of four. In the other case, four against two. So that means inversion. Uh, you don't really care there is, in middle there is a three. You just say that this is ahead of this one. So suppose voting is in this way, although you can argue later that the voting should not be in this way of ranking. But then uh, error proved that no matter how you calculate, there is no way. So let me just show you this uh, three-party voting scenario. So suppose uh, there were three person vote three candidates. Uh, so one candidate is Edison, the other one is Biden, the other one is Trump. Right, so A, B, T. So A favor Edison first, followed by Biden, then Trump. But it's a relative order, so it's very important. It means that Edison's ahead of Biden, Biden ahead of Trump. Obviously, Edison ahead of Trump. Second one is a BTA. Third one is TAB. But if you look at, uh, you compare two person, particular two person, Edison versus Biden. Edison beat the Biden. Why is that? Because in the vote of A, he won. One put Edison ahead of Biden, right? So you have one person favor Edison versus Biden. Three also, three is Edison ahead of Biden. So only two, second one, put the Biden ahead of Edison. So Edison beat Biden. But then you look at the two and three. Two and three, you compare Trump and Edison. Trump beat Edison because Trump, you have a two, two against one. Trump beat Edison. Then the, you look at the one and two, you compare Biden against Trump. Biden beat Trump. The reason is Biden one and two both favor Biden against Trump. So this is a, a famous paradox. Really mean you have a, circular kind of B situation, A, B, 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 T, T, B, A. So you may argue that oh, way, this is not the right way. You have to give more weight to the person ranked number one, a slightly less weight for number two, right? And the third one get a, a smaller weight. And you can prove that no matter what kind of weight you give, there is no fair result. Uh, but the details beyond the scope of this uh, class. So if you're interested, uh, you can take a look. You can just Google called the Arrows in Possibility Theorem. Okay. So just want to tell you, it's, a, it's a really interesting, the real life. Sometimes uh, the order is not a total order, it's a partial order. We deal with all this uh, sorting problem, right? Sorting, you assume that all data really can compare, means A either larger than B or B larger than A. But in real life, just in any kind of sports, like the football teams, right? So you may have A beat B, B beat T, T beat A, and you have a circular kind of uh, scenario. So in that case, how you rank them, how you process those data. So detail I will discuss later towards the end of the class when we have time. And we look at some kind of interesting problem called extended sorting problem. Okay, so now let's look at the inversion. I, I think we have time to probably can finish on basic idea. So you can see that there are lots of inversion. Let's see how we calculate the inversion. But one way you can do is divide and conquer. You have uh, 12 data, you, you partition into equal half. Then you calculate the inversion in the blue color and uh, inversion in the, in the green color, right? So you already have a two inversion number. Then you calculate the inversion between blue and the green. So that's the idea. So it's not too difficult. 
Actually, the difficulty is how you calculate the inversion between blue and uh, green, and what's the complexity. So again, we can assume that the complexity for whole thing is T, right? Then the other is like a half, two copy of a half for that. So we first calculate the inversion in the blue color, blue, blue inversion, which is very easy. You see the look at the five, five ahead of four, which is inversion, five ahead of two is inversion. Then the A of four ahead of two inversion, A two, see the large number appear first, then it's inversion. The green, you have an A inversion. Then the five and eight. But then we look at the blue and green. So blue supposed to all the small number. The green, green one should be the large number. So all you need to, to check is to find out uh, all this uh, blue and green, right? So it looks like uh, it's kind of complex. The reason is that in order to check a green against the blue, or oh, sorry, the blue against the green, whatever, you have to check one against the other one. So it's like uh, n divided by two square, right? So you see that you start with a uh, whole number one, why you don't need to check five, you have to five against six, five against nine, five against 12, 12 uh, 11, and you five against three, it's inversion and so on. Then you try four, four, and then the later you find out four, three is inversion. So you find the nine inversions. But now the question is that, are there any way you can speed up? But total number of inversion is easy. We know that uh, it's just a simple summation. Summarize the inversion, blue, blue inversion, green, green inversion, blue, green inversion, right? So this is a typical uh, divide and conquer. The key things, as you know, learn from this uh, master theorem also, the key thing is the, the complexity of F function means the merge, combine. Are there any better way to, to check? In fact, there's yes. The key thing is that if we can sort all this one, suppose these are sorted, sorted, then things are much easy, much easy. The, the reason is that all you need to check is this one against, uh, uh, so you have a pointer again. So this one is, uh, if this one, two, uh, smaller than three, they must be smaller than all the one, right? So you don't even need to compare the remaining one, right? So you already add six. Then you, you check this one, 11. 11, you against uh, three, obviously fine. So you move the pointer to seven. Then 11 compared with 10 is a fine. Then 11 against the 14, oh, it's an inversion. So you add, right? So, so this, this uh, sorry, 11, yeah, 11 against this one is, is inversion. So you don't need to compare. You add a three, whatever remaining is three. See, that's a key, right? So you have a pointer here, 14. Then the next one, you don't need to start with, uh, with uh, a beginning. You just start 16 against uh, 14. You see this pointer just like a merge sort, very much like merge sort. You keep on moving from left to right, both sides. Although the, the second string is just, you add, uh, you, you move one at a time, right? But this one is like a compare base. Then 16 compare with 14 is fine. But 16 compare with 18, it's inversion. They don't need to compare rest. The size, how many remaining? Two, you add two. Then you can have 17 compare with 18, inversion. Don't need to do anything, just add two. Then the 23 compare with 18, or no inversion. 23 against 19, no inversion. So there's no inversion. Zero. Once this is zero, the remaining must be zero because all the other data is larger than 23. See, this one is very much like a merge process. See, if you change the problem a little bit, if we can sort all this sequence, then the inversions become easy. Right? I mean, calculate the inversion become easy. Then this is very much like the same as like uh, merge sort. It looks like a totally different problem, but it turned out to be a merge sort problem. All you need to do is just sort the sequence. Once you sort the sequence, subsequence, then calculating the inversion between two subsequence is basically a merge sort. 
So the overall complexity is n log n, right? So this uh, shows a, a really interesting example that uh, give you a problem looks a totally different than the sorting problem, but you can change the problem and forcing all this data to be sorted. Then the calculating the inversion becomes much easier. Okay, so that's the, so, so the whole process is like, uh, obviously you still need to uh, do this kind of uh, uh, process, right? Let me just, uh, so you do a sort, sort and count, right? So sort and count, and then the, then you, then you do a merge and count. So one is uh, uh, to calculate the inversion within, and then the, the other one is the inversion between the two. And uh, I think that's the whole things. And detail, you can just go through the, the book. So the key thing is that if you sort this one, then the problem becomes easier. And uh, then you just recursively recall this problem. And uh, okay. So finally, the total number of uh, inversion is three parts. One is inversion uh, within the within the same color, like a blue, and inversion to green then the inversion between green and blue. So that's the two, although this uh, two, uh, three parts use two different uh, algorithms, call for two different algorithms. One is called sort and count, the other one is a merge and count. Okay. Any any questions you may have? I think that's a straightforward. So I think uh, I don't want to go forward. There's a two more problems. So basically we finish uh, this chapter. I hope uh, this one, uh, divide conquer is relatively easy, right? So what you need to really learn for this one is uh, we look at two examples. One is uh, merge, sort, the other counting, inversion. So the key is that you divide into two, then you solve each one by one, then you combine. So the key thing is how you reduce the cost of combine. And uh, then the, in addition to that, I discussed two kind of uh, methods, one called the generation. I used the uh, coin changes example to show you that uh, how you enumerate all the possible changes right, for a given summation value. And then use the example of a maze and uh, using data structure of, uh, of a stack. You only need a single stack. Then when we talk about sorting, I briefly mentioned about the trick uh, that uh, for certain application selection problem, like a select top K, you don't have to sort the whole sequence. Obviously, if you only select the top constant number, you don't need to sort. But the problem is when the K is a uh, variable, like a log N, then the best uh, data structure is a heap. If a K is close to N, then it's better to sort all of them. Although I didn't mention about the hidden overhead, right? There are always some hidden overhead the way you build some sophisticated data structure like a heap. Uh, asymptotically, they're the same, like n log n, whatever. Then we mentioned about uh, when we talk uh, about the searching. I gave you one particular challenge is uh, like searching a diamond. So you see if you can solve that, it's a bonus problem. 
and to show that uh, the distance based on your searching strategy is a constant times the physical distance between your original location to the diamond straight line, we call D location. Then we talk about the inversion and the inversion it has good application like a big data, how you calculate the similarity. And it basically compare two sequence by calculating number of inversion. Then we look at the divide and conquer solution using the merge sort. And more interestingly, the, the, the ranking, right? this ranking problem is like a voting problem. I briefly mentioned about arrows in possibility theorem on voting with the three candidates or more candidates. So I think with this, uh, we, we finish today. Any question, last minute question? I just have a question about the homework that's due tonight. Oh yeah. Uh, for the problems that ask for you to design and create an algorithm, are you expecting us to also prove the correctness and describe the runtime for that? Or do you just want the algorithm? Oh, I, I don't know what's a, it's a written in the book. I think we expect you to ex explain, right? Uh, so the, okay. I can, wording of the question, I think it just says uh, to create an algorithm. So you're also expecting the runtime calculation and the proof of correctness for this? Oh, I, I have to double check. So whatever in the book, it's written there. Well, what's the question, the, the number? Uh, for number, for chapter four, number 13 and chapter four, number 15. Fourteen or fifteen? Uh, thirteen and fifteen. Sorry. Oh, thirteen. No, I I would say that uh, you 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 need to you need to describe what's the complexity of algorithm. That's the minimum. But uh, we are not asking to to show unless it says that the proof is optimal. Because otherwise, uh, how you demonstrate that it's efficient algorithm? 13, right? Is it to 14? Yeah, 13 and 15. Yeah. yeah. So you need to briefly mention about what's the complexity. OK, thank you. Yeah. Because when we talk about the greedy algorithm, anyway, we discuss each algorithm, we discuss the complexity, right? Right. It's linear. So you need to base your combination. Although I didn't ask you to prove this optimum. Actually, proving optimum is very difficult. And this will be discussed. This will uh, be discussed in the last chapter. Yeah. Yeah, over email, I asked you the same question. Uh, I think you told me to prove that it's optimal. Uh, oh, really? Chapter 15. Yeah. <laughs> like I spent some time on that. It's okay to include it though, right? No, no, no. If yeah, if you if you know the no, if you know the like a bound already, it's like a known bound. For example, sorting the in log in. So if you show that in log in, it's already optimal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know the complexity of the problem, it's very difficult to prove the optimal. You have to use some kind of uh, later we'll discuss. It's like information theory. But, but it's okay to include that it's optimal. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, you, you can use some kind of informal argument or whatever <laughs> argument. Okay. Right? But I already submitted that. No, no, for, for, yeah, for example, like the, the celebrity problem, right? So you say that we do a linear solution, then, then you say this is optimal. Why is this optimal? Because you have to ask uh, a person one question, right? So, for example, it's n, it cannot be less than n, something like that. Otherwise, it's not complete. Yeah, sounds yeah. good. Yeah, so, something like that. Yeah. But for more involved problem, you cannot really prove the optimal unless the low bound is given. Okay, any other question? Don't forget that uh, you still have about uh, four hours to, to submit. Okay, let's stop here. Thank you.
Let me. Thanks, Professor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Let me Thank stop you, the recording.